Well, <clears throat> good evening, ladies, gentlemen, and those who still are undecided. DK with Mr. V Amps, and I have what finally really qualifies as a vintage amplifier here. Um, condition is really good. The covering looks really good. Um, the grill cloth is really good. Um, and I, the piece of paper is just a, actually, I just slipped it back there. That doesn't have anything to do with this amp in particular. It's just a descriptor of all the various miscellaneous things we picked up. But this is a Sears Silvertone 1481. Uh, and it uh, it's kind of champ-ish. It uh, looks like 12AX7, 6V6, and a 6X4 rectifier. So I think we can uh, make this thing work, but let's see the status of it right now. Um, yeah, condition is really, really good. This thing looks great. Let's see what we got. Yeah, these are one of those amplifiers where money is every object. Uh, the tubes are glowing. There's no power light because power lights cost money. We have an itty bitty output transformer because big strong output transformers cost money. We have a 6x4 because if you had a 5y3 it would require a 5 volt winding on the transformer and that costs money. So yeah, it's on, it's humming, lots of, lots of hum. A really, a, really, a really, really crackly volume pot. But uh, it's amplifying. It's amplifying the noise out of here. So, and our tone pot actually works really good. Our volume pot sounds particularly atrocious. Cool. I wonder if this will actually amplify, like, guitar noise. I didn't even expect it to do this much, so I wasn't prepared. Let's see if it will amp put, out, uh, amplify anything in the input jack. Yes. So, in the most rudimentary sense, it works. It hums, it's got filthy pot here. Um, it seems to be humming less than it was when I first turned it on. It actually doesn't seem to hum that much at all, but we're going to take a look at the condition here. I mean, it, it's possible that somebody changed the cap. It's still cold. It's not like it's shorted. I don't know, man. If we pull this apart and it's absolutely, like, gorgeous, that would be amazing. But when we pull the chassis, we have to desolder the speaker because they didn't bother to use plug-on clips because that costs money. Well, that's a surprise. I desoldered the leads that went to the speaker and I took out the four screws and then the chassis came out. And lo and behold, there's more screws. But screws and metal cost money. I'm surprised they just didn't put a little flippy shield or something, you know, by the input jack and call it a day. This is like, this is highbrow stuff here. What's under the lid? What's under the lid? Got to know, got to know. Ta-da! Yay! Okay, so we have a death capacitor over there. See, it's going right off the hot wire of the fuse to the chassis. And then in the middle here, our big filter cap. That's a 10 and a 5. Um, there's room over here if I wanted to replace them with something else. That's probably what makes sense to do. Yeah. 
Okay, and then what what are these? So these these are probably um fail failomatics here. Does it even say? They're made in Chicago. That's all it says. Chicago. Chicago brand capacitors. 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and then the death cap is 0.22, usual, usually. What is that? Uh, rubbed out, impossible to read microfarad. Uh, that doesn't really matter. So, this is basically, it's kind of a champy circuit. Um, and we want to make this extra reliable for its next owner. I know the super vintage people will be like, well, if it ain't broke, you can't fix it. So, you know, me like changing out those caps would freak them out um, or, you know, whatever. But this this needs to be reliable and it's in such good condition. Um, I think doing a you know, doing the standard issue, three-prong grounded power cord for no shockies. Make sure all of the uh, uh, tubes are in good shape and change the caps. Mm-hmm. The only cap that'll probably get left alone is that little tone cap because ceramics rarely, rarely, rarely go bad. Okay. Well, I win the Dingbat Award. Um, fortunately, again, we're alive. Our two tubes over here that I tested are fine. This is supposed to take a one amp fuse. It had a 20 amp car fuse in it. Guys, stop doing that. Seriously, just get yourself some one amp slow blows. Um, similar can cap is unobtainium, so we'll adapt. It's gonna look, it's gonna look original, but it ain't going to be inside. It's gonna be more better than original, because that cap is older than me, and it's probably not feeling as good as I do. All right, cool. Okay, so I made a parts list. Now we can move on to the next one. This is uh, by some company called Quantum. It's called a Terminator. I'll be back. Um, K35. And here's the problem. This was actually, this would have actually been on Repairathon number one, but the owner started the diagnostic process themselves, got the board loose, took out the burned up IC amplifier. There's just really, there really wasn't a lot of information on this. I didn't know what that chip was. Um, you know, it was just really a fuzz brain for me, but lo and behold, they found the missing parts so the chip that had failed is one of these TDA things it's got some burn marks on it but I think we'll be able to read that figure out what that is um, it had blown its fuse and a TDA module going kablooey and then blowing the fuse is not that too tough to solve but the L bracket heatsink was not here I had none of the knobs none of the screws you know so I turned it down initially, but now that they found the parts, it's back. Okay, so last time we looked at this, well, I didn't do it on camera because you all weren't here to watch me. But I'm pretty sure the fuse was blown. Let's check. The fuse was blown. The fuse still is blown. And the TDA module, whatever went here, and its heatsink were missing while well, they'd found them for me. Now this heat sink, I mean normally they're covered in thermal compound. This one is like covered in weird magic snot. It was like glued on here or something. It's like some kind of adhesive. And it's like all stuck between the pins. So I don't know, maybe that just went conductive and caused it to blow up. That was a TDA 2030A. I have a TDA 2050. This is, uh, should be close enough. So we're gonna go with that. Okay, so. This thing probably hasn't worked in the better part of 10, 15, a long damn while anyway. So um, these TDA modules, if they're going to, they love to run away if you don't have a speaker on them. So I've got a little junky speaker up here. I replaced the fuse that was blown. 
And I got my Variac out because, again, if this thing decides to run away and blow smoke or something horrible happens, which I don't think it is, you know, we'll at least find out. So we'll turn our thingamajig on here. So the amp is on and it's receiving probably like not point something volts. So we'll give it, oh, there's 25 volts. Just kind of feel around here, see if she's getting hot. Nah, nothing happening. Let's do about 50 volts. And the power light's starting to come on. Oh, I got noise out of the speaker. I can hear sound coming out of the speaker. I can turn the gain pot and I can hear some sound. Okay, now I didn't clean these uh, pots or anything, so I'll probably have to do that. But this is only at uh, 50 volts. So let's see what our input here does. Yeah, it's working. Those pots are fizzy and need cleaned real bad. But it's working. Let's give it some more volts here. And we go up to. Okay, yeah, we went up to 78 volts. I had the gain pretty high. But yeah, as I'm bringing the voltage up, it's getting louder. So yeah, it doesn't look like anything's blowing up. Other than that preamp pot being absolutely horribly filthy and not having any of these screwed down is kind of leaving it with a lack of a ground. So there's there's about 105 volts. Let's just go up to 110. That's pretty much full voltage, right? And it's working. Amplifying my noise and just like even grounding some of these to the chassis just with my finger shuts them up. So, and I think that this uh, this input jack might be a little knackered. Is this one any better? That's the quiet one. So that's the quiet one, and this is the noisy one. Okay. Cool. Well, yeah, so we have a... And then the bright switch just needs to be resoldered. But, uh, yeah, this is probably the first noise this amp has made in 10-plus years. And you got to see it come to life on the Dead Kobe channel. Aren't you excited? Not really. Somebody's like, oh, wow, he fixed a, you know, budget amp from probably the 80s. But there you go. So if the question, if anybody was ever wondering, can you substitute a TDA 2030, whatever, if you have a TDA 2050, yes. According to all documentation I read, yes. And according to what we just did here, yes. Okay, we'll clean the pots, put the rest of it together, and hooray. Okay, so the Quantum Terminator K35 is back together again. I had to resolder the input jack down to the board because it had kind of come busted loose. But uh, other than that, we had to change the TDA chip. It had a TDA 2030A. It now has a TDA 2050 in place of that. Um, gain pot limiter, whatever that does. Bright switch on off level, which to me sounds like a master volume, treble, mid, and bass, and the knobs on this actually go to 11. So that's a very 80s thing to do, but this amp goes up to 11. It's probably going to be the first song it's played in forever, so let's see if it works. Okay, well to me the switch that says bright sounds more like a power boost. For that must be a really efficient speaker to get that much gusto out of a little TDA chip. So let's turn the input volume like to zero, and we'll turn the gain up to like maximum. That's more speaker.
speaker distortion than it is amp distortion. So um, I'm not going to push my luck on this TDA chip. It's new. We'll stick with friendly. Yeah, that's at like 20% 20, 20 volume on the level. I mean, that little puppy has got some go. So, uh, there you go, Quantum K35. Uh, the owner really liked it, and I, now I can kind of get the idea why. Uh, it's featherweight light, and it's got some good volume. So if you were just using it to monitor something, um, you know, if you just need a clean channel to monitor something, um, it would make sense. I mean, it's... Like I say, the weight is very light and it's got a lot of volume for its size. Um, so kind of cool. I mean, it's a little... That module is supposed to be a maximum of like 35 watts. That's probably why they put 35 on there. Reality is they're more like 20. But into a 12-inch speaker like that, it's got some gusto. So, hey, cool. Yeah, another one done. Okay. I wish it came with a forklift. This is an Ampeg V9. It's essentially a guitar amp that has the SVT power stage for 300 watts of tube power into 4 ohms. It also has a distortion circuit and a reverb. It's missing one knob and we don't know if it works or not. So uh, the screw on back panel is AWOL but everything else seems to be here so we should be able to make it usable. This might be a rabbit hole, it might be awesome, but somebody get a forklift. Okay, so this amplifier has six, uh, six five five zero type tubes in them. We have five RCAs and one something else. Um, out of the gate, my concern is with the something else. These getters are usually kind of very silvery, and that one doesn't look really silvery. If these power tubes are unhealthy, this is going to be not cheap. Okay, well, some positive news. It doesn't have a crazy, inappropriately sized fuse. So that's at least a start. So this tube that looks questionable is a generic electric. Doesn't mean it's bad. It might just look weird. It's funny that it doesn't say anywhere on it that it's a 6550. And again, that getter just doesn't look right to me. Uh, let's try it. Okay, so we've got the General Electric, the Oddball 6550. We're going to put the meter on test 6550 and click go and I get an insta fail. An insta fail. So that's interesting. Um, I don't usually test 6550s on this but that's an insta fail usually is it's you know toasted, toasted, toasted. Let's try one of these RCAs. Okay, yeah, it's going to test this one. So we know we have one totally stone dead tube. Let's see how the rest are doing. I think Buddy might be in for tubes and capacitors and, and. This thing's going to be a rabbit hole. But, you know, it's a little bit older than I am and Hopefully he'll find a market for it. I think it's cool as heck. You guys actually enjoy watching the Devo tube tester test tubes? I don't know that it's that exciting. It just sits here and counts up and the tube glows a little bit. As far as 6550s go, there's the standard typical JJ's which are supposedly like a 35 watt 
plate dissipation tube and then the like electro harmonics ones are like more ruggedized and they're supposed to go up to like 42 they're a little more expensive but if they're a more rugged tube and can handle more plate dissipation that might be to our benefit not that we would really bias it a heck of a lot hotter but um, you know hmm. Let's see how this tube's going to do. It is so exciting. Okay, that one's good. So now we just rinse and repeat a few more times. Okay, well that's interesting. Our RCA branded tubes here, uh, all are checking out at eight with the exception of one that checked out as a seven. So it's, it's generally a pretty well matched set. This is considered a, a matching type tester where it will tell you what the current draw is. So we got one that draws a little less, but um, you know, these RCA tubes like matched pairs are, people are trying to get, you know, $250, $300 for a matched pair of these things. Um, I think that's a little wild. But my guess is the, these tubes dealer are about $35, 30, $35 to $40 a tube. And I talked to Boss. Um, obviously, this tube is nothing but a decorator's piece at this time. But it would be possible for us to... Um, you know, sell the RCA tubes down the river uh, and recoup the money that it would cost to buy new ones that, you know, are current production. I know some of you vintage guys are screaming at me, but you know what, this is this is a repair on a budget. We have to try to meet a budget. So if these are more valuable to the general public, um, but again, when we're talking about selling an amp to somebody, it has to keep working. So using a 40-some-year-old tube uh, on tour makes less sense than using a new tube on tour, especially if it's a military model. Okay, so now I'm testing some preamp tubes. This is a 12BH7. Uh, being an Ampeg, there's some tubes you don't see every day. Um, I suppose if you were working on these in earlier days, you may have seen more of these, but I mean, let's face it, the most common guitar amp tubes we see everywhere are what? 6L6. 12AX7, 12AT7, 6V6. Tessos, you're probably good, right? Maybe EL34s, maybe EL84s. What else is there? You know, 5881s, we don't see that often. KT66, sometimes. KT77, almost never. KT88, once in a blue moon. Okay, so this tube works, but it tests as one triode is really strong and the other triode is not really strong so may investigate on what to do with that we'll keep going okay this sylvania 12 bh7 tests as a 15 that is crazy strong crazy healthy as opposed to the rca that got an 11 and an 8 um so it might help if those matched a little better those are the driver, you know, they're they're the ones right ahead of the power tubes, so it might help if they're a little cleaner. Here's a weird one, a 12 DW7. That's a tube I'm not tremendously familiar with. wonder if that's one of those rare, hard-to-get ones. We might have to test this one on the ICO. Okay, 12 DW7 is testable on the um, ICO. It has filament flash, but must be a European tube. They like to do that.
Okay, welcome to the mess. Um, the next thing we're going to look at is, and yes, I will put this stuff away, okay? I don't, I don't want to hear about it. I'm going to get more stuff over here. These are like tools and things I had out. I'm, I'll put them away. Don't worry about it. And yes, I had the vacuum out. I'm cleaning up things as I go. Okay, so this is a 400 watt PV booster amplifier. Um, it should want to output a lot of power. I got the sacrificial speaker plugged in. But when I turn it on, it just makes a, I don't know if you hear that, doing that softly. Um, when I put the input signal in it, like when I, you know, put something in the high Z and really crank it up, I barely get anything out of it. I mean, granted, it's expecting line level, so if I give it something like guitar level, it's going to be soft, but it should be something, and it shouldn't be sounding like a sick calf. So... And then when I snap it, snap it off, it goes meow. So there's definitely something going on. We got some kind of noise source. Let's have a look. Okay, now I intend to pull a schematic on this, but um, this is from our main power supply board, which I really haven't even got a chance to get a really good look at it, but obviously we got big honking filter caps there. Um, <clears throat> just checking voltages from there. One of, I, I would assume this is a split rail. Again, I, I haven't looked. I don't know what it's supposed to be. But normally, for example, we'll just give you an example of 15 volts. If it's a 15 volt power supply, you would have a plus 15 and a minus 15. But in this case, one of our rails is at 15 and the other one is at like seven. So um, that doesn't look right to me. Um, I'm going to be checking some schematics, and then we'll find out what we're supposed to be looking at. Okay, I'm sure with the age of this thing, um, it's probably due for a recap on this board. The filter caps are actually doing a good job. I looked at them with the pocket scope. Everything is doing an okay job, but it just had this incessant buzz and hum, so I started scoping around through it, and eventually we came to the conclusion that this is the balance pot for the transistors it was making really crappy contact so it was actually a dirty pot we cleaned that worked that out now the amp is on and amplifying and the noise is not there because um, that was a pretty annoying noise it looked kind of like a kind of like a sawtooth on the on the scope so uh, yeah put this back together and give it a good test <laughs> Obviously this isn't great listening because we're listening to a open air 12 inch speaker on the floor with my phone which doesn't have a lot of output but uh, you know that's pretty much it it was just that stupid pot it was not making good contact and the transistors were not finding their their center point and their balance so we've got that squared back up and the amp seems to be working and when it is not um, being fed any signal it is nice and silent so that's awesome makes me happy I think that's about all this one needed uh, it's gonna need a handle and some feet and then it, it should be good I mean I don't know that you'd want to take a vintage amp like this on tour but you know for your garage band it'd be cool and these don't carry a lot of money on the aftermarket, so uh, despite the fact that we could do a full recap and a restoration, if this is not going to be out in the field being used all the time, like, for example, my old 70s monitor amp, I use that thing all the time. You know, if it wasn't going to be used every day, if this is a garage band item that gets turned on, you know, once every couple months, uh, you know, it's, it's okay as it is. The caps aren't all burnt out. They're just a little out of tolerance. Okay, so up next on the repair-a-thon is some realistically amplified speaker. This is like one of those old Radio Shack items, you know, that you could uh, plug a microphone into and, like, you know, shout to a crowd. So it was, you know, um, we'll call it an auctioneer speaker. How's that sound? I like that name. 
because I like auctions. Okay, so yeah, here it be. The uh, fuse is freaking huge. Is this even the right type of fuse? What type of fuse is it supposed to have? Does it say 2.5 amp? 250 volt. Again, with the stupid, again with the stupid uh, car fuses. Guys, stop doing that. Um, it didn't have a power cord, but I found one. Um, the power cord is like a boombox power cord. That should work. Let's go get the right fuse. Stop doing this. The silver tone was that way. This was that way. The PV was at least had the right fuse in it. Ugh. Okay, I put a more appropriate fuse in it. Turn it on. Well, helps if you plug it in first. It's not going to get any power. It's not going to have a chance to turn it on if I don't plug it in. And turn it on, and it lights up. And okay, so trusty controls but it wants to work um, we need a microphone that is of the appropriate type for this let me go find one okay so the the jack on the back of it is like uber loose I think it's missing the nut that goes on there but it does try to work so hey 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 so I think we can put a nut on the back of it I have a little battery powered condenser mic um, so I think we can put a nut on the back to hold the switch in place, clean the pots, and this thing will be done. And, you know, it's not a high value item, but if you were trying to announce to a room full of people and you lost your voice, it'd work, right? Okay, so I cleaned the pots and uh, tightened up. The, I put a new nut on the microphone jack in the back, and now I can turn the volume up and down and it doesn't go no, it squeals when you turn it up too loud because that's what it does. That's the world's cheapest microphone, so it's going to sound like rubbish. No matter what you do, it's going to sound like rubbish. But, you know, we put an appropriate fuse in it so it won't blow up and catch fire. The 12 ohm speaker, or the, I'm sorry, the 4 ohm speaker works fine. It looks like the tweeter might be messed up if that's even a real tweeter. I didn't even look, but this is not something you sink a lot of money into. But we've made it from useless to usable now so that's great you know using a boombox power cord a little bit of cleaner and a nut so you know there's your there's your twenty dollar quick fix this is not something I normally you know take in but this is part of a big group of things that I took in so I'll deal with it and there's one more that's actually not part of the music store lot but we need to get to that okay this is a heart key 7000 uh, 350 stereo, but it's in mono mode, so that would be, what, 700 watts roughly? Uh, bass amplificator, and from what I understand, the customer complaint is that the input jacks are whacked. So, turn it on, fan's kicking on, that's kicking on. See if we get any hiss out of our speaker. Eh, I don't get any hiss out of it, but it might just be that this thing is that darn quiet. Okay. That knob's a little jiggly, but I think it's just the knob being jiggly. This thing has been played out a bit. Turn that on. Okay, all those lights work. Alright, so let's see if we can get some kind of signal into it doesn't really matter what. Okay, so this is pretty funny. Initially I didn't get any sound out of it at all and it was marked in mono mode and it just wasn't giving me anything. So then I put it into... Uh, or I, or I, so I just flipped the switch back and forth between bi-amp and mono mode and, and she's, she's working now. So when it's green, it's expanding, I guess, and when it's 
red it's compressing. Seems about right. Seems to be working okay. Let's see if we got any scratchy controls. Not really. My input jacks don't seem too bad. I think we're just going to give this some general maintenance and some love. Okay, so I talked to the owner of this amp on the phone, and uh, his issue mirrored my experience today. He said that it would sometimes work and sometimes not. And initially, I got it here and uh, plugged it in, and it did not work. And I looked, it was in biamping mode. So I clicked it into mono mode and it didn't work and then I clicked that switch a couple more times and then lo and behold it did work. So um, I'm going to guess it was probably just dirt in the switch. The tube checks good, all the pots have been cleaned, all the switches and jacks have been cleaned and uh, I cannot get it to act up. So this is not a tremendously old amp, I think it's probably 90's era. Um, everything's probably pretty healthy. It looks like this amp had a, a smoking habit for a while and that kind of junk will get in your switches. So uh, switches were all done with Max Pro contact cleaner and the pots were done with the contact cleaner and or the electronics lubricant. The lubricant does have some cleaning properties. It's real good for pots, but the contact cleaner is preferred for switches. Uh, the lubricant can be shot in switches. You're not gonna hurt them or anything, but uh, anyway, after cleaning the pots and switches and everything, this amp seems to be just fine. I can't make it act up again. Um, but it should be like a 90s era hard key. This is actually a pretty nice, nice amp. I would have, uh, you know, considered this if I was uh, doing a big uh, bass rig. I, I'm not a huge rack guy. I kind of like the heads where they're already in the boxes. But I've got my PV Firebase 700, which is uh, perfectly acceptable for what I need. Um, <clears throat> this one should be, yeah, this is a 350 bi amped. Should be a very solid uh, bass amp for the guy. And it looks like it just needed general maintenance, so, you know, uh, affordable affordable fix up here. Okay, so this is the silver tone. The object here is to replace the three sections of the filter cap, which are a 20, a 10, and a 5, which fortunately modern day caps are small, so I don't need a big tube thing like that. And uh, we're going to put a little term strip in here and uh, make that work. Yeah. Okay, so the filter cap area is done. Um, all of the uh, original filter caps are disconnected. You know, the filter cap, which was a 20, 10, and 5, that's all been disconnected, and it is now connected to my three little caps here. Now a 10, uh, 10, 10, or 20, 10, 5 is actually still available. You can buy them but they're like 30 some bucks and um, that's uh, again not nearly as affordable as buying a terminal strip and putting in a array like this and I actually didn't hack any of these wires up in size or anything I was able to retain their original sizes so if somebody really wants to restore that part but I mean we're good for another 20 years as it is so now we just have to go down to this end and uh, deal with uh, those two point oh ones down there Okay, that was an aggravating amount of work for two caps, but it is what it is. When you get this stuff that's all point to point like this, it gets it gets jumbled, you know. Everything's on top of everything else and you gotta worry about what's touching what and whatever and you know it's nice that they sleeved a lot of these things, but they didn't sleeve all everything, so you gotta just keep checking it. So at this point we're gonna put an appropriate fuse in it and then we can test it. Okay, speakers hooked up. I think I put a little bit lighter fuse in it than it actually wants, but... Okay, we just switched it to on. And... Tubes are lighting up. There's glow. It's good. Volume is... One of those two. Can't, don't know which one's which. Oh yeah, she's amplifying. What's the finger on the tip noise? Wow. This amp is like silent, silent. If, uh, 
I don't get doodly squat for hum. And I suppose we should try it with the guitar and see if it's loud enough. I don't think this is going to be a particularly loud amp anyway, because it's uh, okay. So I don't want this thing to lay on its tubes or it'll mess itself up. Guitar plugged in. That's the volume. And that's the tone. Okay, so let's see if it plays. That's adequately loud. All right, cool. So, vacuum, put it back together, one down. Sometimes you fix a little amp that's, you know, not, I mean, this was a super budget amp, but it really sounds pretty good. How cool is that? You know, and this isn't even turned up yet. Kids, it's time to work on the Ampeg. And this is the preamp top section here. Um, we've got a couple of issues that aren't issues. They are, but they're not. Uh, this is Magnavox era Ampeg, so it's essentially built out of TV parts. And uh, it's kind of obvious. Like right here, you have a 30 microfarad. 600 volt DC capacitor and try to find a 600 volt capacitor at the amp shop good luck um, but we do have at our disposal you can either buy them from an industrial supply but then of course it's not going to be axial it's going to be some snap in whatever cap so it is possible to find a 600 volt the price is ridiculous but when you're trying to repair on a budget you can always do the Leo Fender trick and you can take, if you were to take 260 microfarad, 350 volt capacitors, and put them in series, you would get a 30 microfarad, um, 700 volt capacitor. So that would work. But uh, of course, 60 microfarad caps don't grow on trees either. So, you know, we round we round up round up a little bit, find, you know, the closest equivalent we can, and we're going to do a series and then this is a double section cap. I think these are 20s, 20. I think this is 20s. So, I've got two capacitors to go in where that one's at. And there we go. This is a fabricated 700 volt capacitor to replace our 600 volt. Um, it's essentially two regular electrolytics coupled together and then I wrapped it with electrical tape to increase the thickness so it would fit into the original ring and then I put a zip tie around it. Yeah, it ain't the prettiest, but think about this in the way that I'm thinking about this. It has to work and it has to be repaired affordably so the gentleman can sell it. However, if this is ever purchased by the museum curator type, the fact that I did not cut and remove that ring 
and I did not alter the length of any of those wires, means that if Mr. Museum Curator wants to take that old rusty busted 600 volt capacitor, drill and hollow it out, and install new modern capacitors into it to retain the vintage look, well, there they are in their original beauty, and they'll be returned with the amplifier. So, essentially, what we tried to do is we tried to repair the, or replace the worn, vintage, leaky filter capacitors, whatever the hell these capacitors, all their functions, the electrolytic capacitors that needed change, without actually really altering the wiring scheme of the amp. That's one of the things that you'll find I did on the silver tone also. I installed a uh, terminal strip, but I did it with solder. I did not, I actually soldered it to the ground of the old cap. I didn't have to drill any new holes. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to be sort of non-destructive here, be as efficient as possible, achieve what we needed to achieve, and then if this is ever purchased in the future by a museum curator, um, they can go back and they, they have a good project to work with. They have a good base. I didn't go in and butcher the crap out of it. You know? Does that make sense? Does it? Huh? Huh? Alright, power amp time. Okay, so the power amp is recapped. The original can caps were a 40 and a 100 on each one. And good luck finding any of those today. Allegedly, the guys at Flip Tops, amp, you know, Ampeg parts have them. But, uh... I didn't find them in any of the general vectors, so I got a double 100 and a double 40, so that works. You have to move things around a little bit, and moving things around is mighty confusing in one of these Ampegs because you have um, some caps that are hooked head to tail and some that are tail to head, and you have negative voltages and positive voltages and lots and lots of voltages. So. Like this is our bias cap over here, so that's you know positive to ground. Um, but yeah, just an adventure. Uh, I tried to retain you know the same clips if I could. So this is one of my made caps, and then a lot of times I'll just take the cap, wrap some electrical tape around it to make it thick enough. It slides into the holster, and there we go. So we really didn't have to take any more than a millimeter or so, a few millimeters, uh, off of any of these wires. So. Again, if somebody wanted to restore that, you know, to factory, whatever, they can. Um, you know, I granted, you know, caps wrapped in duct or red electrical tape kind of looks a little goofy. But um, I would say that I didn't uh, completely and totally make a mess. I guess now we got to try to kick the tires, light the fires, and see if she explodes. We're going to check for some voltages and things first, though. Okay, so I had to put the preamp and the power amp together because the preamp section has the on switch. So at this point we can put some voltage to it and uh, I guess we have to see if it explodes because if I put one of those capacitors in there backwards then okay bang, right? Here goes nothing. Okay, so I have a power light and no explosions. You were really hoping for explosions, weren't you? Okay, well, our power supply should be mamma jamming around here. Let's look if our tubes are glowing. We should have our preamp tubes lit up here. Alright, and uh, I see some preamp tube glow, and most of them. That looks good, so now the next thing we can do is we can take it off the standby, and then that's the other thing that will cause explosions. Three, two, one, and no explosions. Alrighty then, so let's get the voltmeter and we're going to check to make sure that we have a bias voltage and B plus and all that good stuff. Okay, well, the voltages look reasonable. Um, uh, now granted this is completely unloaded, but we got close to 700 volt plate, uh, 350 screen, and a bias voltage of about minus 46 so that shouldn't be too crazy because obviously the voltages are all going to change around um, as soon as we put tubes in it but I have a bias voltage so it should be safe to put tubes in it. Okay so our power tubes are in I shut the light off so we can see the filament glow 
and then we're going to turn on the B+. Plus. I didn't lock all of these straps. These straps are tight. So anyway, here goes. And it made a little bit of a crackly noise. It's quiet. It's not humming. I got a little bit of a speaker noise when I flipped it off a of standby. Not too out of sorts. Let's we'll see if it amplifies anything. Let's get the guitar cable. Hopefully amplify with reverb. It amplifies. Does channel two amplify with reverb? Yes, it has reverb. Seems like everything is generally operational, so it'll be a matter of checking the bias, giving it a listen, button some things up, making sure everything is all well and good. But in the most general sense, we have made a lot of progress. Very cool, very cool. range is switchable between 300 hertz, which sounds very bass like, 1000 hertz or 3000 hertz. So, versatile. Plenty of brightness. The reverb is very reverby. This distortion thing on channel one, this distortion is kind of a, a joke. It's weird, the distortion um, definitely kills volume. It's some kind of clipping circuit and it's, it just chops them off. So I guess they figure that channel one is going to be your distorty channel and channel two is going to be your happy channel. Honestly, I think that distortion is about as useful as a football bat. But ultra high 
high switch. Which definitely brings in some more highs. It's like a super bright. So, yeah, she's fixed. I did do the bias and all that stuff, and everything looks good. So, happy MPEG. Anybody got a forklift to take this back? All right, guys. I think this is the last one on our on this leg of the repairathon. There are still more repairathons. Believe me, there are. So I will see you very soon.